There's a question that a man asked many years ago, thousands, in fact, thousands of years ago, and his name was Pontius Pilate. Pontius, I'm not sure it was his first name. I think that was more of a a title, but uh, his name was Pilate, and he had the dubious responsibility of conducting the trial of the only perfect man to ever walk the face of the earth, and he questioned him, And he came back with his verdict, and he says, I find no fault in this man. At least he had some brains, because he found no fault in a perfect man. But the problem that we have with Pilate and his eventual verdict was that he was a pragmatist instead of a true, honest person. He, He decided to do what was expedient instead of what was right. Anybody ever had anybody like that in their life? Um, Machiavellianism would be the the current term. Uh, As long as the end is okay, the means is kind of okay. You know, the end justifies the means. So anyway, he asked a question, and his question was this. What is truth? That question is the age-old question that's still being asked today by millions of people and possibly billions around the world. What is truth? I've traveled 75,000 miles in the air in the last 12 months. We're scheduled to leave again in about six weeks for another 22,000-mile trip. And I've been literally all over the world multiple times in the last year, and everywhere we go, that is the question. I have one guy looked me straight in the eye and he said, you have your book, you have your truth, I have my book, I have my truth. And then he went like this, go away. The problem is, there is only one truth. Everybody look, go like this and put your finger up. Say One one truth and his name is Jesus Jesus said I am the way not a way I am the truth not a truth and the life okay no one comes to the father but by me but see deception is everywhere deception's been around ever since the beginning when the devil deceived Eve into thinking that God did not have her best interest in mind when she was in the garden. He got her to think, oh, that fruit, it's so lovely on that one tree. You have to imagine, I don't know how many trees were in the garden, but I imagine it was more than two, okay? Let's just say it was more than true and less than a billion, okay? It gives me a lot of leeway. And God said, from every tree you can freely eat, except for this one in the center of the garden. Don't eat of that one. And that's the one where Eve is sitting there going, hmm, looks good. Yeah, I know all those are there, and they're the same thing, but wow, that really looks good. And that's the one that we can't eat from. Then the devil comes like a snake. He was a snake. Now, we're we're in a different world because if a snake came up off the ground and started talking to me, I'd be like freaked out, okay? But it must have been normal because she wasn't freaked out and didn't run away. But the devil comes up and says, "Um, has God said you can't eat of any tree? She goes, oh no, we can eat of any tree we want. We just can't eat from this one. Oh, what happens if you eat from this one, the devil? Now, number one, when the devil asks you a question, tell him to shut up and give him scripture. Don't carry on a conversation with the devil. That's point number one. When the devil asks you a question, don't answer him. Only give him the word. Because when the devil asked Jesus a question, he did not start reasoning with the devil or answering his questions, because I I, I had the opportunity many, many years ago to sit down and spend about two days with a billionaire. Now, it's it's a great opportunity. He was from Australia. He was a billionaire, and I got to spend two days with this guy, driving him around, taking him out to dinner and stuff, and which he made me pay, which I couldn't figure out, but (laughs) I was 28 and didn't have any money, and I had to buy lunch. I'm like, come on, man. You're the billionaire. Buy me lunch, but that's, a, that's another point. 
But my point is this, and he, he made a statement to me, and he said, the thing you have to remember, Bernie, as he called me, who's ever asking the questions is in charge. Who's ever asking the questions is in charge. Be careful whose questions you answer. And then he took me to Jesus and he said, when the Pharisees asked him questions, most of the time he never answered their questions. Pay attention sometime and look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the times people challenged him with questions, by what authority did you, do you do these things? Who told you you could do these things? He never answered their questions. Because if you answer somebody's questions, you are letting them lead you. Instead, answer with truth. Instead of answering their questions, answer with truth. So when the devil asked Jesus a question, he just answered with truth. And when the Pharisees answered, asked the question, he always answered with truth instead of just answering their question. So, where was I? I just got off on a tangent. Where was I? Somebody help me. Were we in the garden? The devil asked Eve a question. There you go. And she says, oh no, we can eat of any tree. We just can't eat of this one tree. And then he says, then she saw that the fruit was good and desirable to eat. And then the devil says this. And he told her a bold-faced lie. She said, as soon as we eat this tree, we'll die. The devil will always ask a question and then he will absolutely oppose or say something diametrically opposed to what God said. He said, you will not die. Well, God said the day you eat the fruit, you'll die. But the devil says, you'll not die, right? So then she looks at it and she considers, she, she continues in her conversation with Satan right? She answers his question, and then she con continues her conversation that is always a problem. Don't allow the devil to get you down over here with conversations. When you start declaring that by Jesus stripes you're healed, or my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory, and then you hear a little voice over your shoulder, and it says, but what if he doesn't? That's a question from Satan, but what if he doesn't? Or you're declaring that you're believing and trusting God for healing, and then you hear, but what if it doesn't come? Don't engage those. Merely continue to double down on truth. Because when the enemy can get you to engage with him and get you off track over and over here in the weeds, he can always get you further in the weeds. And that's what he did with Eve. Eventually, Eve saw it. She saw the fruit, and she ate it. And then she gave it to her husband, and her husband, who actually had heard the, thing direct, the command directly from God, Eve wasn't there when God told Adam not to eat. Adam told Eve, okay? So Eve was responsible to her husband. Her husband, Adam, was responsible directly to God. And her husband committed treason at that point in time by eating of the tree. He committed treason. God had given him full reign, full authority, complete authority over the earth. God had given that to Adam, and when Adam ate of that tree, he gave that authority to Satan. As is referenced when Satan is, is tempting Jesus in the garden, he said, here's all the, the, the kingdoms of the world, and he looks at all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory, and he said, these are all mine. They were delivered to me. You know where they were delivered? They were delivered when Adam ate the fruit. They, he delivered his authority over the earth to Satan. So Satan is the little g God of this world, and he, was, he received that when, he, when Adam sinned in the garden. So deception begins when you begin to question what God has told you as truth. So what, what's the answer to deception? The answer to deception is not reasoning. You can never reason your way out of deception. If someone is deceived, no matter how much 
facts or how many facts you give that person, it won't change them because they have deception. See, deception is a spiritual condition that occurs in someone's life. When the enemy, Satan, gets someone to believe something that's not true about themselves or about a situation, it's a spiritual condition. Deception is from the pit of hell because the father of lies is who? Satan, the devil. It's the father of lies. So if someone is deceived, it's a spiritual condition. You can't solve a spiritual condition with a natural or intellectual solution. It doesn't work. You can't legislate morality. I know in the 80s we had something called the moral majority, okay? Jerry Falwell and Liberty University, God bless him, Jerry's in heaven. But the fact is you can't legislate morality. What you can do is you can have righteous laws that protect the innocent, and I'm all about that, okay? I'm all about righteous laws that protect innocent lives, okay? But you cannot, <clears throat> you can't make laws that force people to be moral, it just doesn't work because morality is a spiritual issue that can't be solved with a legislative, social, or natural solution. So you can't reason with deception. That's the title of the message today. You can't reason with deception. The only answer for deception is truth. That's the only answer for deception. See, Pontius Pilate, when he said, what is truth? He was standing in front of truth. The embodiment of truth was standing before him, and he still said, what is truth? That's the ultimate deception. You're looking eye to eye, toe to toe with truth, and you say, what is truth? That's just, that, that's the ultimate deception because he didn't even recognize what was right in front of him. John 17, 7 says, your word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 60 says, all your words are truth. So God's word is the standard, this book, God's word is the standard for truth. Jesus is the personification or the embodiment of truth. John 1 says the word in the beginning was the word. The word in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. See, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. So if we look, what is, he also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, the nature of deception is they believe that they're right. Anybody ever run into somebody that's absolutely wrong and they will argue forever and never relent that they're right and you know they're wrong and you can't get through their thick head that they're wrong. And you know what? I've been that guy. I hope you have too. I've been that guy who, th would, who knew he was right. And then you go, oh, later, when you realize you were wrong. See, being deceived by nature of deceit, you think you're right, but you're wrong. And the only answer is revelation. That's the only, only answer is revelation. When the Spirit of God reveals to you. I remember, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell on myself now. I remember when I was first a dad and a coach and I coached, my, my dad coached me all the way through, and I coached all my kids. I have five sons, and we played everything with a ball. If it had a ball, we played it. I mean, football, basketball, soccer. We never played hockey because it's not a ball. Um, <laughs> and I don't like to be cold. So there you go. Um, 
But all, all the sports, baseball, everything, we played it all. And I coached them every time they played. I coached because I let somebody else coach my kids once, and I was like, they don't know anything about this game. So I coach. I had a lot of fun coaching, and I was kind of intense, as you can't hardly imagine I'd be intense about anything, would you? <laughs> but I was pretty intense. They kicked me out of ASO soccer. They said, you aren't supposed to win every game. I go, then why play? Because ASO soccer is like, you ain't about winning. And I'm like, yes, it is. Everybody keeps score. They say they don't keep score. Everybody knows who's winning every game. Come on, stop with the hootie hoo. It's, everybody knows who's winning. Well, we would win 10 to 1 every game. When they got sick of me, they asked me to leave. Um, and I wasn't being mean. My kids were just better. <laughs> but the point is, when we played, I would get pretty revved up, and my wife would go, Hon, honey, you know, you really need to just dial it back a little bit. And I'd be like, no, man, I'm good, I'm good. And she'd be like, oh, honey, uh, you really need to dial it back a little bit. These kids are like eight. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's time for them to grow up. <laughs> and I wasn't being like vulgar or anything. I was just being intense, you know? It's like, come on, move it. Let's go, you know, and they're like, I'm sorry. I'm like, okay, well, a little bit too intense there. But so after probably two years of her pleading with me, finally one day I wake up and I had had kind of a bad day with the officials and they asked me if I'd like to sit in my car or continue coaching. <laughs> yes, Pastor Bernie. And I said, no, I'd like to stay here. Then he looked at me and he goes, then shut your mouth. I went, oh, all righty then, I'll do that. And he goes, good. I'm like, okay, cool. So that was kind of my come to Jesus moment. Stop being an idiot and uh, kind of start, start following the example of Jesus now that y'all think I'm an idiot. Sorry, but that was a lot of years ago. I don't yell at officials anymore. But the point is, I had to have a come to Jesus meeting because I thought I was right, even though I was wrong. And even though my wife was right and told me that I was wrong, I still thought I was right. That's, where, that's how deception works, okay? And it wasn't until the Spirit of God, one morning at like 5 a.m., and I'm sitting on the side of the bed, and I'm feeling pretty bad about how I acted the day before, and kind of feeling condemned and the spirit of God says to me it says careful when you feel you're being unjustly judged you'll act irrationally that word right there he says be careful because when you feel you're being unjustly judged you'll act irrationally and I was like because when I was a kid I got unjustly judged by my mom all the time and got there was a bunch of things that happened when I was a kid that I won't get into or start to cry, and I'm not going to do that. But a lot of things happened in my childhood that were very unjust, and it really scarred me. And so that when I got old enough, I said, dang it, nobody's going to treat me unfairly again. So I had this lie that I believed that I had to defend myself because else people were going to treat me unjustly. And so when I saw my team getting, I thought, unjustly, I reacted. And so what ended up happening is that with that one word from God, I went, oh, truth came. See? The next time something's happening, I go, Wah! hold it. I feel unjustly judged. I better, be, I better be careful or I'll make a, a fool of myself. Shows the mouth. Problem solved. What was the difference between day one and day two? I received some truth from the Spirit of God. See, nobody could reason me out of it. Nobody could shame me out of it because people tried to shame me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I go, Jesus bore my shame. Leave me, leave me alone. <laughs> I always had an answer for him, but it wasn't until I heard the word truth from the Spirit of God that just, it wasn't condemning, it wasn't loud, it was a whisper at five in the morning. He said, be careful when you feel unjustly judged, you'll react irrationally. 
And I was like, oh, that truth changed everything and I was able to not be foolish anymore, right? Because that's not good. That's not a good testimony. I had somebody call me an ASS one time and they were right. They were right. But the point is that truth undoes deception. See, and that's the only answer for deception is when you believe a lie, the only answer is truth, okay? That's the only. So what are some, what are some common deceptions in our culture? Well, a big common deception in our culture is that abortion is health care. I'll just go there. Does that offend you? Good. There. <laughs> I'll step on your toes some more. Abortion stops a beating heart. End of story. It's a baby. And I understand your situation. Please give it to someone else to care for, then don't kill your baby. Please, 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 a thousand times please. Let someone else care for your baby. If you can't do it, let someone else. Please. There's no condemnation. I don't have any stones to throw, but please, please let someone else care for it if that's the case. Abortion is not health care. Abortion is murder. And I don't want to throw stones at anybody, but it, it needs to be said that, that it's not. It's not okay. Okay? Another big lie that's out there is all religions are the same. That it's to have different names for the different gods. Newsflash, there is one God. His name is Jehovah. All other gods are false. Okay? Period. Allah is not God. Allah is not God. Jehovah is God. Okay? And Islam and Christianity are not the same. They, I, I have been in a lot of uh, Islamic countries. Trust me, there is nothing similar of Islam and Christianity. Nothing. One is a works-based religion that's founded on fear, and the other is a love-based relationship that's founded on sacrifice. The one says, you have to die. You have to sacrifice yourself and kill innocent people to go to heaven. The other one says, Jesus, the innocent, sacrificed for the guilty so you could go to heaven. They're so diametrically opposed, it's not even funny. Do not believe the deception that they're the same. They are not the same. They're not even close in the same universe as the same. We're dealing with people who, when they accept Christ, they look at us as we're, and they, most of the time they get very angry. They tell me to go home, go back to America, you arrogant, arrogant American. What are you doing here in our country? Go away. They get mad at me. And we talk and we talk. And one gentleman in particular, he was telling me that, because we, we travel with guards, because we have to when we're, when we're in these countries. And he says, your guards don't scare me. You aren't going to make it out of here alive. That's what he told us, flat out to my face. He said, you're not going to make it out of here alive. You should not have come here. He said, you're not going to make it out of here alive. And I just looked at him and I was like, I think we will. And so he yelled at me, continued to yell at me for like an hour. And uh, after we're done, I said, I said, I'm so sorry you're so angry. That's all I said to him. <laughs> and he was like, That's all I said to him. I said, I'm so sorry you're so angry. It must be very difficult in your situation. You're getting a lot of pressure from the people above you, aren't you? That's all I said. I said those two words to him. And he starts complaining about his superiors to me. You know, they're, 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 and I served 20 years and they don't give me nothing and blah, blah, blah. And he's, he's ragging on his superiors, right? And he's like, and I got all this pain, and, and I got this, I can't even sleep at night, and I feel like my heart's going to stop, and I don't know if I'm going to die or what's wrong with me. There's no health care in this country. And he's, <laughs> I'm sitting there trying not to laugh because he's basically complaining about his country that he was so proud of five minutes ago. And I'm like, I said, I'm so sorry that's going on in your life. I said, if... Uh, if my God could, could take away that pain that's in your shoulder and in your heart, do you think maybe um, that would help? He goes, 
Why are you here anyway? He starts diverting. Why are you here? Why, are, why do you care about these people in the slums? You shouldn't be with the people in the slums. Take care of the educated people. Take care of Americans. Just leave my country. Don't ever come back. I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to come here. Sorry. And he goes, why do you come to these slums? Why do you come to these poor people? And I told him the parable of the banquet, how there was a rich man. And I told, just told it to him like a story. There was a rich man, and he sent out invitations. He invited all the rich people, and they all made excuses. And there was a lot of room at his banquet. And he said, go out and ask the poor and ask the lame and, and ask them to come in. And they did. And then there was still room. And he said, go and compel them all to come in because I want my house to be full. I said, so that's what I'm doing. I'm going to the hedges and the highways and the byways, and we're taking all the poor and the rejected people of the world, and we're bringing them to God's banquet. His son, who was very angry and very hostile toward us, starts to weep, and he says, that's the most beautiful story I've ever heard. And the man, and I said, could I ask my God to heal you? And the guy goes, goes like this and I, so I'm, I'm totally winging it I mean this is we're in a really dangerous situation and I'm winging it right and I'm going okay Lord what do we do next what's next so I said uh, I'm just making it up as I go literally just we're like on the fly I said okay uh, close your eyes and put your hands like this I have no idea why I just told him <laughs> So he, he sits there, and I pull up my chair right up next to him. I'm like, I'm like this far away from his knees. Put out your hands like this. And he goes, he opens it. He won't close his eyes. I'm like, okay, don't close your eyes. I don't care. Um, so I put my hands over top of his hands, and I prayed in tongues for like 10 minutes because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Literally, I didn't know what to do. I just prayed in tongues for like five, maybe five minutes. I'm just sitting there praying in the Spirit. And finally, I asked Jesus to reveal himself to him in a very w- real way and heal his, his neck and heal whatever's wrong with him and give him a soft heart and reveal himself, that Jesus would reveal himself to him in a tangible, real way. And I, opened, I closed my eyes. I opened my eyes, and I look up, and he's weeping. This man who threatened to kill us 15 minutes earlier, about half hour earlier, he's weeping. His son's weeping. And I said is your pain gone? And he goes, all my pain's gone. And he goes, how'd you do that? What spell did you use? So that spell, his name is Jesus. If you'd like to receive him, you can. And he looked at me and he goes, no, I don't want to receive Jesus, but thanks for, my pain's gone. So he had, he had some people in, in his captivity or whatever that we needed to get out. So I said, now you need to let our guys go because he had, taken some of our guys as hostage and uh so we told him that and he actually did he released three of our guys he's he's still holding one but he had five he killed one released three and he still has one but so my point is it wasn't until he was encountered with the power of god and truth and actually the spirit of god that he was he was he was dumbfounded didn't know what to do You see, and that's the only answer for this deception. I've had different people in different situations look at me and say, so you're telling me everything I've ever been told for my entire life. These guys are in their 50s and 60s. Everything I've ever been told for my entire life was a lie. I said, "Uh uh-huh. It's not the truth. Jesus is the truth. And they have accepted Christ today. And they're, they're people that were sold out, ready to die for their other, ready to die for what they believed. But because they encountered truth, the person of Jesus. See, truth is the person of Jesus, and it requires the presence of God. It requires revelation knowledge. And you can't do it with reasoning. You can't do it with, with fancy speech. You, it wasn't a great oration that got their, their attention. It was the presence of God, and it was the presence of Jesus that got their attention. That's what gets people's attention, is truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free, will set you free. See, truth is rigid. Two plus two is four. In every culture, two plus two is four. Now, in our culture, they're trying to tell us two plus two is whatever you feel like today. But the fact of the matter is two plus two is four anywhere on the globe. 
Two plus two is four. It's rigid. Oh, that's so rigid. Christianity is so rigid. You know, oh, it's, I'd, like, I'd like my faith to be more like a trampoline, one person said, okay, who we won't name. But he said, oh, my faith is like a trampoline. It gives and gives way. Do you understand one thing about a trampoline? A trampoline won't work unless there's a rigid framework. <laughs> you got to have a rigid framework. Or you, you try, okay, you're going to jump on a trampoline with no rules, no regulations like Snoop Dogg? He says, oh, there's no rules, no regulations, just love, baby. Okay? <laughs> try jumping on a trampoline with just that mat on the grass. Have a ball you ain't going to get very far because it requires a rigid framework. You can't have any truth without absolute truth. If there is no truth, then nothing works. There has to be truth. Up is up and down is down. Gravity works every time or it doesn't work at all. So, oh, I wish God would suspend gravity no, you don't, because if he suspended gravity, we'd all be flying all over the room. It'd be chaos. Sounds like fun for about 10 seconds, and then you go, oh boy, where's gravity again? I know this wouldn't hang if we didn't have gravity, but hey, whatever. <laughs> for all us older folks, gravity's a bear, I know it. So, anyway. Our, we our weapons that we fight with are not natural. They're not reason. They're not intellect. They're not those types of things. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, and they pull down strongholds. What pulls down strongholds? Truth. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We're ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So we're, we demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? Stronghold's a, a, a lie that you believed so long that it becomes a pattern of thought or a pattern in your life. That's a stronghold, okay? I had a stronghold in my life and it took a word from God to destroy that stronghold. That stronghold was limiting my effectiveness in ministry because it was, people were going, that's crazy, right? So God had to speak to me to destroy that stronghold because I believed something that wasn't true. And I was acting out of pain instead of acting out of truth. So as we look at John 8, 32, it says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The context is he's speaking to his disciples and he's saying, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll truly be my disciples. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. This truth that he's talking about is not just knowing something or head knowledge. It's a continuous, viable, interactive relationship with Jesus like they talked about earlier today. It's having a real relationship with Jesus that involves give and take. It involves prayer and worship and understanding. The truth refers to Jesus himself. He even says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's not merely an intellectual assent to truth, but really knowing Jesus as the truth and having a personal relationship with him. Do you know that whatever you submit yourself to, you become a slave to that thing. Ask anybody who's ever smoked cigarettes, they would tell you they become a slave to the burning stick. I used to smoke cigarettes, I understand. Anybody who's had any kind of addiction, you become a slave to the addiction. Funny, I was watching a, 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 a program on TV, on, on TVN this past week, and they had Alice Cooper on there. Now that's a scary looking dude. And Alice Cooper did a lot of drugs when he was singing, right? But Alice Cooper got saved later in his life, okay? And he's still scary even after he's saved. But um, I'm like, dude, you still look scary. But so he was talking about how he was married to this lovely Christian girl, and he was such an addict, he would do anything to get heroin. He would do anything, literally anything sell anything, betray anyone, steal anything from anyone just to get 
that fix. And he was saying how it becomes your God. The addiction, that thing becomes your God over everything else and you become a slave to that thing. He then got free, thankfully, and he got saved. But that point, what he said, he said, you will give anything for that addiction. He says, it's such a stronghold in someone's life. And I would just give you this, if anybody is battling any kind of addiction, I would say that Jesus is the addiction breaker. That, that, that as you give your heart and life to him completely, you can be free. It is possible. There is life after cigarettes. There is life after alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, or pornography, whatever it is that you're addicted to. There is life after that thing. But you've got to go to Jesus, and you've got to ask him to set you free because he's the only one that can set you free. He is the only one that can set you free. And there's 12-step programs, and God bless them, and there's freedom ministry, and there's this and there's that, but ultimately, Jesus is the only way to break free from any addiction. He is the only way to break free. And I would, if, you, if you're struggling, I would encourage you to go somewhere where they, where they use a Bible as your tool. Right. Where, as you do some kind of freedom ministry or addiction recovery ministry that uses a, a, the recovery Bible or some kind of Bible like that as their handbook because Scripture is the only way that you're, and Scripture is Jesus, so the two of them together. It's not merely an in, intellectual understanding, but it's a deep personal relationship with Jesus that will meet that need because nobody gets an addiction because, because they just say, oh, I'd love to become an addict. Okay? Nobody ever woke up one day and say, gosh, I'd love to jam a needle in my arm and, and sell my body so I can get another fix and ruin every relationship in my life. Oh, I'd love to do that. Nobody ever woke up and said that. Instead, they had a need in their life that was a glaring need, and this thing lied to them and told them this would meet that need. Just like Eve and the tree. She had a need, and she thought that was her answer. And whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography or whatever it is, it always promises it can meet that need, but it never can. It's a lie. It's deception. And you become a slave to whatever you give yourself to. Romans 6 says that you become a, whatever you submit your life to, that thing you become a slave to. Whether it's to sin, you become a slave to sin, or whether it's to righteousness, you become a slave to righteousness. So today, I would say submit to Jesus. Submit to righteousness and not to sin. See, freedom only comes through Jesus. What does this mean for us today? Deception is a spiritual issue, not an intellectual, not a in, uh, cultural issue. Deception is a spiritual issue, can only be solved spiritually, it can only be solved by the person of Jesus and revelation knowledge. What's this mean for us? What does it mean for us? That true freedom only comes through relationship with Jesus. That when we get into a relationship with Jesus, the good thing about having a relationship with Jesus is he said he's going to give us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, it says in John 14, 26, Right? The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. So it gives us discernment so that when you're in a situation, the Holy Spirit can say, don't do that. Or stay away from that person. Or be careful. Right? You have that still small voice that's in the back of your head. Because why? Because that's the Holy Spirit trying to steer you away from trouble. That's discernment. And it offers freedom. See, the sin, guilt, and spiritual death are what happens when we walk in deception. But life and freedom is what happens when we walk with Jesus. You can have freedom and you can have life. Pilate's question, what is truth? The, the crazy thing about that is that he was looking truth in the eye, but because it was inconvenient... It was an inconvenient truth. Newsflash, truth is rarely convenient. Just think about that for a while. Truth is rarely convenient. 
rarely. Most of the time, deception is more pragmatic. Ah, you know, it'll be all right. Nobody will ever know deception. Ah, you know, that's so hard. Can't we just do this instead? Deception. See, truth is rarely convenient. I would would almost venture to say ever, okay? It wasn't convenient for Jesus to go to the cross. It wasn't convenient for him to be born in a manger coming from the throne room. It wasn't convenient for him to be beaten to a pulp and spit on and shamed. It wasn't convenient at all, but it was what was necessary, see? And that is the the path that he's called us to. Not to the convenient, not to the pragmatic, not to the, oh, it makes sense to me, but rather the way of truth. See, truth is the only answer for deception. So today I would just, I would venture to say that in each of our hearts, with myself included, there was a day when I was deceived, not just about yelling at referees, but about life in general. When I was 22 years old, I was not walking with God. I had been raised in a Christian home. I knew better. I had tons of scripture memorized. Christian school, Sunday school, catechism, you name it, I went there, right? My parents, from the time I was a baby, I was in church. Youngest of nine kids, everybody in my family, that's what we do. We go to church. You know, I missed church like twice because I faked being sick so I could watch Lassie or something. But... (laughs) But you guys don't even know who Lassie is. <laughs> Gosh, I'm old. It's the most beautiful collie ever. But <laughs> squirrel, sorry. Um, who has ADHD? You be quiet. <laughs> My point is all that, now that I got you all laughing and loosened up, see, that works. But all that, and I didn't know Jesus. And I, it wasn't until a guy was, was courageous enough to confront me, that's when I got saved. See, I, was, I had all the answers. I knew all the answers. Every time somebody asked me something, I could debate them off the stage. I could argue, I could do everything. I mean, I, I loved all that because I loved a good fight. Because I grew up in a big family. It's what you do, man. You argue and fight, man. I'm in. Let's go. This is sport. But that doesn't go anywhere. And this guy knew by the Spirit of God. So he, he started talking to me one day and said, what happens when we die? And I said, what? Go to heaven or hell? Whatever. Let's play tennis. And he goes, and then we play for a while, and then we're up at the net, and he goes, you know, where do you think you're going? I'm going to leave me alone, dude. Let's play tennis. He goes, no, I want you to answer me. Where do you think you're going to go? I said, I'm going to heaven. He goes, really? You really think you're going to heaven? I said, yeah, I'm going to heaven. He goes, why do you, how do you think someone goes to heaven? And I said, I asked Jesus to forgive you your sins, and he washes you, and and uh, then you go to heaven. He goes, how do you think Jesus can forgive? And I told him the whole thing. He died, lived a sinless life, came from heaven, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, raised from the third day. He's coming back again to judge the living and the dead, which is straight out of the Heidelberg Catechism. So, <laughs> and he goes, wow, you really know your stuff. He goes, so you think you're going to heaven? And I'm like, yeah, let's play tennis. And he goes, you're going to hell. He flat out told me, he says, you think you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, pal. You don't know Jesus. And I, you know what I told him? In all of my earthly wisdom, I said, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Proving I wasn't saved, right? But that guy didn't back up. He said, no, the problem is you think you're going to heaven, but you're going to hell. I know I'm going to heaven because, you know, and he, and he was a good guy and he was living right. And he, But see, it took that kind of a, to me, and it made my life miserable for the next six months because I was like always questioning late at night going, wonder if he's right. Wonder if I really am going to heaven. I'll drink another beer. That'll make it feel better. And it wasn't until about six months later that I finally came to the final end and I said, Jesus, I need you. My life sucks. And my life didn't suck in the natural. I was working at a big firm, making lots of money, all that. All in the natural, everything was fantastic. 
But in my heart, I was miserable because I knew that I wasn't right with God. See, I had all the knowledge up here, but I didn't have a relationship with the word, with truth. I didn't have that relationship. And it wasn't until I had to come to the end of myself and the end of my own ideas and the end of my own wisdom and say, Jesus, I need you. And I asked and I prayed that night on February 5, 1985, on that night at 11 p.m. And I prayed with my sister and I got saved. And I'm wondering today, have, have, is there anybody here that's never done that? And I would just encourage you, challenge you, if you will, that if you can't look to a place where you say, I gave my life to Jesus right there, I would encourage you to make sure that you are right with God. Because it's, you don't get right with God by being born into the right family. I had that. You don't get right with God by learning Bible verses. I had that. You don't get right with God by going to Christian school. I had that. By going to church, I had that. None of that makes you right with God. It's not until you finally say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I am hopeless without you. Jesus, make me new. Make me new. That's the only way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and nothing else works. Nothing else works. He's the only way. So if you'd close your eyes, please. If that's you today and you say, I don't know if I've ever done that where I've said, Jesus, you're my only hope. I need you. I'm not going to call you up here and make you a speaker or anything like that. I'm just going to ask you, because you know what? When I got saved, I didn't have to get up and speak. I was on a couch in my sister's house. That'll come later, hopefully. But you know what? No pressure. But today, if that's you and you say, Jesus, I need you and you're my only hope. And I don't know if I've ever done this before, but Jesus, I need you today, and I need you to save me. I need you to make me new. I want to be born again. Write my name in your book. I want to be sure, sure, sure that I'm going to heaven today. If that's you, lift your hand right where you are. Just lift your hand if that's you. Just lift it up high. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, today is a fantastic day because today salvation is here. It's here. It's available. Bible says today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. But listen. So I'm going to pray for those that lifted their hands and for the rest of you also. Father, we thank you for the truth of today. Father, your word is truth. Jesus, you are truth. And Jesus, we call on you and we say, you are our only hope. You're, our, you're the son of God. You are truth and there is no other. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I give my life to you. I give my life, spirit, soul, and body to you. And I thank you that you, your blood cleanses me from all sin, makes me brand new, and sets me on a path. And my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. You are Lord, amen. Everybody say it with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord. Lord, amen. Give it up for Pastor Bernie. Thank you so much. Was anyone blessed by that message today? Come on, so good. We wanted to just honor him, and it, we wanted to give everyone an opportunity to do this. If you'd like to sow financially into Pastor Bernie's ministry, jump on our app. We have a spot that you can literally select the category on the Give tab, and you can choose to sow into him. I just love it. There's so much that came out even first service, and I, he's doing an incredible work. We want to have the opportunity to sow. He's sowing into churches, sowing into Pakistan, and his ministry is touching the world. So thank you for being a part of today, Bernie. We really appreciate you. And third, John, it says this, please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. 
for they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be partners as they teach the truth. So as Bernie's teaching and he's going to different churches and he's going to different places all over the world, we actually get to partner with him and that's how the Lord receives that. So if you'd like to partner again, we have the app. If you want to use the website, it's resonline.org. There's a tab at the top that says give. Please go there. If you're one of those people that just loves using cash, we have envelope boxes in the or envelopes in the front of the seat and the boxes are in the back. And we'll make sure you write guest speaker. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's guest speaker on that. So please take advantage of that. We want to sow into Pastor Bernie. Also, Jacob, if I could have that, the salvation card for those that raise their hand. We want to get in touch with you. So please fill out this card. Even if you, you maybe didn't give your life to the Lord today, but you need help or you're going through something, we find out all the time as somebody that's just going through the hospital in the hospital or going through something in their family. Please write that out so we can be praying for you as a staff or visit you if you're in the hospital. We'd like to take advantage of that. A couple more things. Fred and Val, would you be willing to stand up? Come on, give it up for Fred and Val. We love them. Do the smile and wave. I want everybody to see your faces because Fred and Val lead the 11-step group here. They literally use the Life Recovery Bible. They have been doing this how many years? 12 years. And yeah, come on. Working with families, working with couples, working with people individually. You guys can be seated just to sow into them. And fun fact, uh, when I first came to this church, I was the guy that tried to sit in the very back row and like get by without anyone noticing me. Fred and Val were um, greeters at the time over at that door right there in the children's entrance. I remember exactly where it was. And he was ever so kind to me and everything inside me was screaming because I just wanted someone to leave me alone. And I walked all the way in, I was a part of worship, and Fred came up to me and was led by the Lord and goes, you have a calling on your life and I see it. So this man not only knows his word, but he knows how to be led by the Spirit of God. So take advantage of their ministry. They're doing such a phenomenal job. If you need prayer for anything, please come up front. We love you guys. Have a good weekend. Thank you for coming.